Hello and welcome to It Started With A Kick, the podcast in which well-known fans and high-profile figures in the world of football talk to us about the first match they ever attended and a bit more besides. I'm your host, Richard Foss, and I'm absolutely thrilled to introduce today's guest, Sky Sports main commentator, Peter Drury. Like most leading commentators, Peter started off his broadcast career in local radio at BBC Radio Leeds at a time when Leeds United were riding high at the top of the first division. He then moved on to network radio before switching to television with Match of the Day before joining ITV in 1998. And then in the last decade, he's been with the likes of BT Sport and Amazon and since the beginning of last season, Sky Sports. So, Peter, a very warm welcome to the show. Let's get straight into your first live game, which was back in November 1985, at a ground that no longer exists. Yeah, Boothbury Park, uh, which which still holds a, a very, very big place in my heart, Richard. Uh, the background, those who know how old I am, might be surprised to hear that my first live game wasn't mm. until 1985. Uh, I, I grew up uh, in Kent, the son of a vicar, uh, and I wasn't in a family that went to football on a Saturday afternoon. Mm. Uh, we lived opposite a, a public park, and I, as a small boy, used to stand on the radiator in my bedroom and watch Sunday morning football. Well, Sunday morning, I was in church. But Saturday <laughs> afternoon football, um, uh, listening to, at the same time, to the football on the radio, the great voices of the time, Brian Butler and Peter Jones, mm-hmm. um, and, and watching park footballers run around. And then sometimes with my brothers go out and play in their muddy goal miles when they were finished. Uh, and so we just didn't go to football. It wasn't part of the rhythm of our life. And so... I didn't go to a live professional football match um, until I went to university, uh, the University of Hull, at the age of 18. Mm. And so my recollection of going as an 18-year-old and starting to go regularly to professional football matches as an 18, 19, 20-year-old is probably parallel with most people's recollection of going to football as an 8, 9, 10-year-old. That's you know, I, I, I have... I remember walking into Boothbury Park for Hull City against Middlesbrough in the full members trophy or whatever it was called. Full members cup, I think. Full members cup. Um, uh, And just as a small boy would, just being overcome by Mm. the floodlights and the greenness of the pitch and and what to me felt like a glorious, glorious stadium. Um, And I went on my own. I didn't go with friends. I, right. it, it was a it was a curious, almost sort of geeky, um, tardy childhood experience. You know, I I did that thing that I should really have done ten years earlier. I was every bit as much a follower of football and lover of the game, and and in that childlike way, anorak follower um, <laughs> that that so many others are. But I just hadn't done the actual thing itself. Um, and that game, which which obviously was such a, a humble game, there were barely more than 3,000 people there, to mm. me felt so big and yeah. so showbiz and so um, all-embracing. And, and in a way, um, I've never really shaken that off. I think, I think having been a late starter mm. has, has helped me retain that childlike enthusiasm, which I, I really hope I still have now. Yeah, no, it's a very interesting point because the, uh, the majority of people who I've had on the podcast, their first game is roughly when they're seven or eight. So, yeah. uh, and it is extraordinary that the majority of the people, and a lot of them involved in football or football, their fathers weren't into football. And um, my father wasn't into football. He was a rugby man, so he wouldn't take us. So it, it's... It's interesting. And also commentators are a particular breed because I've had a few on here. And as you say, there is, without being too rude, there is a certain nerdiness about them. Um, And another interesting issue as a parallel is, you know, you say you're the son of a vicar. Well, John Motson's dad was a Methodist minister. So, you know, uh, people say football's a religion. So you're moving from (laughs) the Church of England, let's say, to Boothbury Park. It's, It's quite an interesting transition, isn't it? That's absolutely so. And as a small boy, when I used to have to sing in the church choir and my dad was taking a wedding on a Saturday afternoon and I had to miss the football on the radio to go and, oh. you know, sing at, sing at a wedding at two and then another one at 2.45 and then another one at 
And I was thinking, what's the score? You know, <laughs> so um, yeah, I, I always had that. I, it wasn't a conflict in my life because it, it never occurred to me as a conflict. You know, going yeah. to football. Um, I, you know, I grew up in Kent, where everybody's second favourite team was Gillingham. So I was always interested in the Gillingham team. I know we're not going into allegiances here, particularly, but no. um, you know, we, we um, just f- for me, the, the the scores coming in on the radio and all those voices that I, I loved were football. And then, like every little boy and girl, I grew to the age where I was allowed to stay up for match of the day and all all mm-hmm. of those things, which which are a regular part of everybody's childhood experience and. You know, the big match on Sunday lunchtime. Yep, yep. Well, yeah, uh, with the roast beef and on with Brian Moore. Absol- well, we, yeah. Brian Moore in London. Uh, yes. I know there's other commentators across the country. Um, yeah. So let's let's go back to Boothbury Park. So it, it, you say it was that, you know, your first game is that platform, the, the launch pad for your love. Do you still have an image of it in your mind? Because it was an evening game, wasn't it? Which is unusual. Most people go to Saturday. Yeah. Well, the youngsters won't go to Saturday. They'll be on Monday night at eight or whatever. But <laughs> most people, Saturday three. But yours is an evening game. So the floodlights is a, obviously something that oh. must have impressed upon Oh, they thrilled me, floodlights. And even before I went to those games, if I was in the car traveling somewhere with my parents or whatever, and we were going past the city or whatever, you know, yeah. the, just seeing the floodlights of whatever the football team was, was for me a sufficient kick. And so yeah. to be under the floodlights um, was a great thrill. And I was a student, obviously. And uh, so like students do, I went to the game on my bike, which generally had a couple of flat tires. Yeah. And I I, um, I chained it to the gates behind what was the away end at um, Boothbury Park, which, mm. which was fondly known as the Grand Ways End. There was a supermarket in the away end at Boothbury Park. Um, and then, and then walked around and, and I was the first in the ground. I mean, I was so excited. I, it was, I was like at Christmas and I was often the first in the ground, actually, when I, when Hull became a, a habit for me because, yeah. um, because I was a wannabe goalkeeper and, oh, really? and one okay. of my heroes of that team, um, was Tony Norman, the, yes. the Hull goalkeeper yes. at that time, who I absolutely adored. And on a Saturday at three o'clock when I went, uh, mm. I used to be in at one o'clock. Literally, I was there as they opened the turnstiles because right. Tony Norman used to come out and do a, a sort of pre warm up, warm up at yes. about one o'clock, and I was the only one in there watching him. And <laughs> and, and he 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 became. He, I mean, he was a very very good goalkeeper. He was yeah. a very good goalkeeper. He, I think Absolutely. he won a cap or two for Wales, and if it hadn't been for the fact he was in the Neville Southall era, and yeah. to some extent Eddie Nitschke as well. Yes. Um, you know, he he was he would have been a worthy Welsh international goalkeeper, and and I'll never forget. I bumped into him in Hull City Centre once, and I couldn't bring myself to speak. <laughs> <laughs> yes, well, you know, if there's a restraining order on the young Peter Drury for Tony Norman, I mean, he made all three hundred and seventy odd appearances. You know, he was one of those people. I don't know if he was a one club man, but you know, to make that many appearances and and lots of he went home to Sunderland. Sunderland. He went on to Sunderland after all the. Yeah, yeah. 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 But uh, so Hull City, uh, not the most glamorous club you could go to. And and as you say, Boothbury Park was. I've been there a few times. It's not. It wasn't. It was great because it was an old style ground. I do remember the railway station because it was right there behind one of the stands. But the game itself. So you, you know, you got used to your floodlights. You got there early. You've been the first one. Did do you have as an eighteen year old? Maybe you do have a clearer memory than someone who's eight of their first game. Yeah, I think, funnily, it's hard to know, isn't it, whether whether your memories are really your memories or the result of having gone back over it in yes. subsequent years. What I do remember, strangely enough, and this is a bit macabre, one of the better known players in the Middlesbrough team. I've had to look up who scored for them, and a very well known player scored for them, um, Bernie Slaven. Yeah. Um, but one of the better known players in the Middlesbrough team was a fellow called Tony McAndrew, who yes. was a name that was very familiar to me. And he, and I do remember this quite clearly, was was carried off quite early in that game. He took a oh, right. took a really bad knock and mm-hmm. I th- and was stretched off. And the vividness of that, oddly enough, has stayed with me. I can't remember any of the goals, but yeah. I remember Tony McAndrew being stretched off. And 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 this is almost a terrible admission, but it, it was a kind of a moment where the reality of it struck me. Um, mm. You know, 
I'd, I'd heard about players being carried off on football matches. I'd even seen it on the telly, but I was actually seeing someone for real being carried off on a stretch in a football match. Yeah. And that's a t- poor Tony McAndrew is a human being who was doing his best for Middlesbrough Football Club. And yet this, this was a kind of enlightening moment for me. These things really <laughs> happen. These players I've heard of are actually yeah. real players. Um, yeah. And that, that struck me um, uh, as part of the, as I say, I was doing this all 10 years too late. And so I was having childlike thoughts, really. Mm. Um, and uh, what struck me, too, was the, um, even in the very small crowd, and I mean, it was small by whole city's standards yeah. then. They were generally getting sort of six and 7,000. That night was 3,000. Uh, was the hero worship for Billy Whitehurst, who was, of mm. course, a, um, an absolute club legend yeah. uh, and the bane of every centre-half's life because... Uh, Yes. To put it in kind modern parlance, he put himself about, yes. um, and he he scored a, he scored a couple of goals, and actually later that season left for Newcastle. That was his big move, mm. uh, and it it didn't go as well. It, it worked for him at Hull because Hull yeah. was that sort of a club. It, when he went a bit higher up the pecking order, it probably didn't. But I mean, he was to be a bit less. He was a brute of a centre forward. And he scored a couple yeah. of goals, um, but I only got the back end of his whole career. Um, and the, the first goal was scored by Frankie Bunn, mm-hmm. who who did become a hero of mine, actually, um, I, perhaps because he scored my first goal. Um, yes. But uh, he later became famous. And I know you're, you're, you're a great geeky quiz type of guy who mm-hmm. loves these things. But he became famous for scoring six goals in the League Cup tie for Oldham. Oldham Athletic, was it not? Yeah. Was it yeah. Can you tell me where he scored? Yes, it was. Can you tell me where? Who the mm. opponent was? Um. <sighs> I'm going to go Stockport, but I'm not right, am I? It was Scarborough. Scarborough, Scarborough, yeah. of course it was. Six but goals, yes. He scored six goals in the League Cup tie, and he he um, he became you know part of my dreams, Frankie Bunn. Uh, he he was he he just was, and oh, for wow. a few brief weeks, um, Frankie Bunn was the manager of Oldham, and so mm-hmm. I had to call Frankie Bunn as a by then fifty year old or whatever. I was fifty. Yeah. He was, <laughs> yeah, yeah. and. Uh, and he met all my hopes and expectations. And I got on there trying to be professional, and I turned into a complete fanboy um, <laughs> and started talking to Frankie Bunn about his days at Hull City. And he was such a charming guy. Um, but there you are. So take yes. us back to 1985. Uh, he, you know, he was, he was a very vivid part of that evening as well. Yeah, no, I do remember him. And, and looking through that whole team, as I say, I, I went to Hull a few times with uh, Palace. Richard Jobson, I remember. Yeah. Went on to have a Skipper. very good career. He did, didn't yeah. he? Peter Skipper. Yeah. I hope he was the captain, because if not, that's a bit of lack he of wasn't. nominative I'll tell you who the captain was. Peter Skipper was a really, really good Jobson and Skipper to, to have a big, sturdy... Uh, yeah. But this was a team that had come up from the third to the second division, the second tier, you know, what right. we now call the championship. And although we've been quite used in recent years to Hull being in the Premier League, you know, yes. second tier then for Hull, second division, was really a magnificent achievement. Brian Horton had done a great job with this yeah, club. Yeah. Uh, and they were, in a way, punching above their weight. And and they there was the, the following season, they actually were at the top for a little while and people were pinching themselves. But Skipper and Jobson were, were massive. And Jobson went on to play for Leeds and at Oldham, I think possibly in the Premier League. But the mm. captain was a guy called Gareth Roberts, oh. who, was, um, who was a one-club man. Um, yeah played I think nearly 500 times for for Hull Um, and I had another moment with him I went in I'm getting the impression by the way and I don't want to give this impression that I'm a Hull City fan I'm really not but I had this I it's like your sort of first girlfriend you know it was it it was I had I had this sort of um, affair you know Hull City (laughs) now sadly I'll know I'll know more a part of my heart than any other of the 91 Um, no. But but at that moment uh, they were, and he he um, Gareth Roberts. I remember going in to the ticket office to mm-hmm. buy a ticket. I suppose one midweek day, and he was there, and he you know he was very polite and said after you and all of that sort of thing. And, right, and uh, yeah. I thought, gosh, and and that and again, this plays into. I, I hope what still. Uh, is true that you realize in those moments that these guys who we worship adore and sometimes vilify are humans they're just mm. humans yeah. you know uh, and uh, gareth roberts was just a human and he was <laughs> it, it, there he was in front of me for real and it, it was 
it was a remarkable thing. So he he was he was he was a really good sort of chugging midfield player. He got right. about the pitch and and yeah. led the team well and 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 um and people loved him for that. But beyond those mentioned, actually, the one who always used to catch my eye was a little Geordie Wigger called Billy Askew. Um, right. Ginger haired guy, mm-hmm. dribbler. And yeah. uh, he, he was a thrilling player. You know, he used to take on a fullback and deliver a cross. And, and I remember standing behind the goal. And when, when Hull were attacking our way, mm. you know, and he was running towards you, it was a really uh, engaging kind of vivid moment. And Billy Askew became, became in, in many ways my favourite, apart from Tony Norman. Nobody was bigger than Tony Norman in my life. But yeah. Billy Askew of the outfield players was, was a real thrill to watch. A hero indeed. Yeah. So as you yeah. as you mentioned, Brian Horton was the manager then of Hull. And funnily enough, someone you know, Mark Pugach, he went to his first game, which was Brighton against Notts County. And Brian Horton was not yeah. only on the front of the programme, but he also scored a great goal to win the game for Brighton. So Brian Horton is, is coming into this uh, podcast quite a bit. Brian, so. Horton, Brian Horton had a magnificent career, if you think about it. Yeah. He, was a ledge, he was a ledge at Brighton. Yeah, um, he was a ledge at Luton, where he was Definitely. David Pleat's captain. The famous brown suede shoes day at Manchester yeah, City yeah, yeah, when yeah, Luton stayed turf. up. That, yeah, yeah. that was that was Brian Horton, and uh, I spent three years singing about Brian Horton's black and amber army. So yeah. um, you know, he 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 can look back on his life, Brian Horton, with a lot of pride. I think wherever he went, yeah. you know, yeah, he yeah. was he was really appreciated. Absolutely. Now I do want to um, pick up on one thing. So you. You very kindly sent me a list of some of the games that you went to. I mean, some of the games. Um, your next <laughs> game, I just need to, to um, point out to the um, audience, was Hull against Crystal Palace. And a young-ish Richard Foster was on the terraces amongst the Palace fans to see yeah, us win amazing. 2-1 yeah. with a man called Trevor Aylott scoring twice. Now, Palace fans of any age, Trevor Aylott was not the most sophisticated player I've ever seen. And the fact he scored two goals was actually quite a surprise to me when I checked it out. Yeah, well, I looked at that Palace team, mm. by the way, uh, and it really is interesting. Um, first of all, I have to say that I, I was surprised myself at the gap between my first game and the second. That wasn't until the beginning of December, that Palace game. Yes, that's right. Um, that's partly because I was still playing football then, and so I wasn't able to go most Saturday afternoons, but yeah. I got badly injured in an away game at Liverpool University diving out at a striker's feet. And so that was the end of my sort of competitive football career, competitive in inverted commas, which yeah. freed me up to go to more of these games. But um, by then, Billy Whitehurst had left. Andy Savile was up front for Hull. Yeah. But I think I probably was quite entranced by the Palace team, which, and Trevor Aylott wasn't one of them, no. had some famous names. Paul Brush, who I yes. remembered from West Ham, yeah. um, and back. who famously played fullback and occasionally called Brush Sweeper. Which was brilliant, mm. but um, <laughs> the the massive man who was Mickey Joy, yeah, uh, played Chelsea, in that team. Yeah. Uh, yeah, who was sort of six foot nine or something silly. Yeah. <laughs> That's an exaggeration, but you know what I mean. Um, and George Wood in goal. Yeah, George Wood, who who obviously it's, I think had been Blackpool, but then famously Everton, and yeah. largely but not always understudy at Arsenal. Um, and there he was, you know, and yeah. I. I was, I was, as I say, a wannabe goalkeeper. So I was always enthralled by the goalkeepers. And George Wood was, was, um, you know, a very, very well-known goalkeeper. Yeah. Uh, and so I was, I think I was probably excited to see him. Um, but I also noted, and I can't pretend for one minute to have remembered this because at the time it probably wasn't notable, but Ian Wright came on in that game. Right. Yeah. He yeah. Came on for Phil Barber. And I, I looked, I looked it up when we were going to talk yeah, and yeah. that was his first um, season with Crystal Palace. Yeah. Yeah. Ian Wright. Yeah. And he went on to do okay. He was all right. He was all right. <laughs> his his, his, his um, career slightly dipped when he went to Arsenal, I felt. Um, <laughs> yeah. Wright actually used to be in, in, in that, for that season, he was nearly all, Always subbed, and he nearly always came on, and he nearly always looked threatening, if not scoring. So that was the beginning of the, you know, obviously bright, the right bright partnership, and that's when Palace began to actually become what they should have been for many years before. But we're not here to talk about Palace, so not here. <laughs> um, so 
as you said, you you you're at uni now, and you know, unfortunately, you get injured. So, did you go pretty much every home game now for the next couple yeah, of seasons? Certainly, so, yes, yeah, yeah. largely I, when I was there, um, and and when they weren't at home, I used to get the bus across the Humber Bridge and go and watch Scunthorpe or Grimsby. Um, right. So, um, and or go elsewhere. You know, I I used mm. it as a as a base. Um, to watch what I could, and and once in a while I had a friend who had a car, so we could go to midweek games and not worry about you know, and yeah, as yeah. you know, on the student circuit, if there's someone with a car, you know, they're they're gold, they're very popular. Gold. So, so we used to go to Rotherham and Doncaster, and mm-hmm. um, uh, well, I went to I vividly remember Leeds against Derby in the second division, which was at that time the biggest game I'd ever been to. You know, and I stood on the cop at Ellen Road and and uh, yeah. just heard the vitriol all around me and, and the mm-hmm. strength of feeling around that fixture, which is obviously a, a very famous fixture. Um, but no, when Hull were at home, broadly speaking, I went to watch Hull um, and and loved doing so. Uh, and and the start of that, I think my my second season was the one where they really uh, began to fly yeah. uh, and and were top of the second division. And apparently, and with a chance of getting into the top flight, which was quite unthinkable, um, yeah. and indeed rightly, because in the end they got nowhere near. But they had, yeah. they, had a, they had a terrific start, and I do remember going. I think it was my first away game to um, Bramall Lane, Sheffield, mm-hmm. and uh, doing that thing of being in a group of supporters coming off a train and being escorted to the ground by yes. police, which yeah. you know, I I couldn't believe I kind of had to do that. Actually, yeah. and I'm not trying to sound a pompous twit, which I probably do, but I thought, <laughs> I'm, I'm, honestly, I'll be fine walking to the stadium. Thank you. Yeah. But yeah. anyway, I had to do that thing, and that day, Hull got well beaten, uh, right. and the sort of the bubble burst and all of that. But but um, yeah, it, it it was a really um, kind of entrancing time um, mm. to to do that. And funnily enough, I, I remember also going to an away game at Crystal Palace during um, mm. during my uh, during a christmas holiday or something um mm-hmm. in the second division i know what i remember about that i couldn't even tell you what the score was but i remember walking i had a whole city shirt which i still right. got upstairs in the cupboard the okay. 1985 six whole city shirt um, and I remember walk- yes yeah it was fortunately it wasn't the one which the following season was sponsored by twydale turkeys so which i thought right. was always one of the less mm. kind of um, charismatic sponsors. But anyway, yeah, the, the, so, yeah. <laughs> mine, mine doesn't have that. Anyway, I was walking down, like, probably Homestale Road after mm. the game and a, a double deck of London bus came by and somebody from the top deck threw a coin at me oh. because I was in the away shirt. And um, I always remember, again, being a twit. I picked up this coin and turned around and thanked him for it because he just missed. But <laughs> anyway, there we are. <laughs> well, I there think we that's are. the way to deal with something like that. So, <laughs> yes. so it's fine. Yeah. So there you are. So you've, you've become a whole, not a whole fan, but you've become almost a devotee. So you go to a lot of games during your university uh, time. But then when you left uni was that it in terms did you cut your ties with hull as it were and just say right well i'm moving on now yeah but broadly speaking yes i mean because hull had never been the team i supported per se Mm. um (laughs) they'd just been my introduction to watching professional football and so i'd grown an affection for them and and uh as as i mentioned to you when we were preparing for this when Mm. i went home also uh i i had um a local affection for gillingham so I yes. used to go and watch watch um, Gillingham play um, fairly often. Towards, I, I, I'm always sad to report that I missed the um, Steve Bruce days. I just missed out on Steve Bruce, so I think left Gillingham mm-hmm. in '84 for fame yeah. and fortune with Norwich and then Man United. Uh, but yeah. I got the back end of Tony Cascarino, um, and uh, it was a Gillingham team managed by Keith Peacock. Mm-hmm. Um, who is also, Richard, the answer to a quiz question. I know what the answer is. Go on, the first substitute Correct. ever used. Yeah, yeah well, so G- G- Gillingham became, uh, very good, by the way, Gillingham became a <laughs> a uh, a, um, a little sort of sideline for me as well. And sure. I, I, th- I, I mean, I, I used to play, uh, when I was at home, I used to play uh, club cricket on a Saturday afternoon for my local mm-hmm. team. And I, I always right. remember... Um, one September day, 
where we all turned up for cricket and um, the rain came down and we all jumped into the back of someone's car and drove to, to Gillingham and, and there were sort of 10 of us together in the, in the rain of end watching yeah. Gillingham Middlesbrough in the third division, which oh. was, uh, you know, which was great fun. And, and there, there were a, a sort of a few days and nights like that. And, um, yeah, it, it was great to go to the priest field because I was on the, I, I was brought up near Sittingbourne, which yes. uh, people know is on the, sort of the other side of the Medway towns. So it was a 15, 20 minute train trip from Sittingbourne to Gillingham and yeah. walk along the sort of narrow terrace streets. And, and again, I was, I was still at the stage where I was sort of charmed by floodlights. And most mm-hmm. of the, most of the games I went to were, were under floodlights. And, um, it was, it was, uh, fun. It was just fun. Well, I mean, it's, it's almost natural justice that you should go to Priestfield Stadium when your father was a vicar. I well, mean, I don't right, know if you made right, that yeah. connection before. <laughs> I never <laughs> really did. I never really did. But, um, but, but they were a decent team. They, they never, yeah. ever, Gillingham, seemed to go up or down. They were no, made for the third I mean. tier in those days. Mm. Um, and I don't know if we're going to come to it, but there was there was one, one fabulous... Um, playoff campaign which i, I think i think we, this is a good time to go to the playoffs, well yeah it I was mean, the first year of the playoffs in fact yeah. i wasn't really i hadn't realized yep, 1987 yeah 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 well um gillingham um i was in hull but i i always remember they had a semi-final against sunderland yes which was which was the, probably still i mean people will have long since forgotten it one of the most remarkable two-legged uh, exactly, playoffs that yeah. have been, and the playoffs are upset. I mean, we had didn't, several came back from five nil down the other year, Shepherd Wednesday, yeah, Peterborough. Yeah, 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 but, yeah. but this this was probably up there as one I of the. I think you're right, and, and it finished six six on aggregate in the mm-hmm. semi final, um, and Cascarino scored a couple of the away goals at Roker Park against Sunderland, which which yes. enabled Gillingham to get through to the final. Um, and I'd listened to that second leg. It wasn't live on the radio anywhere, uh, at least no. not in Hull. Um, but I remember listening to the radio, to Radio 2 on that, that Sunday afternoon, pacing mm-hmm. up and down in my horrendously yeah. filthy student house, um, <laughs> listening to these goals go in and, and feeling really caught up at the moment and mm-hmm. wanting Gillingham to go through. And by the way, off the back of that game, there, there's a real, um, or there was for a long time, I don't know if it sticks, it's a real brotherhood between Sunderland and Gillingham fans. They sort oh, of yeah. fell in love with each other in a very improbable way. Um, mm. But um, anyway, Gillingham got through to play Swindon in um, what then was a two-legged final. This yes, was before that's they right. took them to Wembley. And yeah. I, I had to be there. I had no right to be there. It wasn't like I'd been to Gillingham home and away for the last 15 yeah, years. Yeah. But this was their biggest game that I could remember. Of and course. they had a chance of getting up into the second tier. And so I absolutely horrified my dad by suddenly turning up at home one day. And what are you doing at home? I said, I've got to go to Gillingham. <laughs> and and he had no interest in Gillingham. He had yeah. much more interest that I was going to pass my end of year exams, which were coming up. This is end of right. May time. Mm-hmm. And uh, so I went, I caught a train from Hull back home, went straight to Gillingham the day before the game to queue yeah. around the block to get a ticket mm-hmm. um, and got a ticket. And Gillingham beat Swindon 1-0. Yeah. I, I don't much remember the goal. I remember the game because... Um, I mean, this probably isn't very funny because, you know, there were disasters around that time, which mm. changed the dynamic around this. So I'm not looking to, yeah, in, yeah. in any sense, um, glorify circumstances which became awful uh, in that mm. sort of era. But I remember it being so tightly packed that you could almost hardly clap. You know, it was, yeah. it was so yeah, packed yeah, yeah, in. Yeah, yeah. Um, but, but that since since on that occasion it turned out to be perfectly safe and i got out and i was thrilled it was was a really thrilling sensation you know something like sixteen, seventeen thousand, i think in the priest bill that night when yeah, yeah. normally they got three or four uh, sure. at that time so they won one nil and what i remember is i suppose uh, a uh, a would-be journalist at that time or reporter of some sort was the kent messenger right. the next day um and i might misquote this but talk talk about um premature celebration or whatever there were there was a mm. big banner headline i forget what it was but i think the opening paragraph read something like the the church bells were ringing on the banks of the river medway last night <laughs> as gilliam and gilliam had won the first leg by a single goal you know yes that that was the sense of oh my goodness we might yeah. really do this and yeah. of course um swindon won the second leg 2-1 away goals didn't count 
in the final. Right. And yeah. so it went to a third game at Selhurst Park and Swindon won it. 2-0, um, yeah. 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 So, yeah. so, so um, I don't know what the Kent messenger did with that, but they probably buried well, it in the back pages <laughs> yeah, somewhere. Exactly, don't they? correct. Yeah. 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 So, the, yeah, I mean, this is an interesting journey because you're starting off at, at Boothbury Park, then you're going to Priestfield Stadium, you know, quite a little bit. So you've got some grounds that not some people may not have been to. I mean, Boothbury Park doesn't exist anymore, but they're, they're not grand stadia but you then you told me a little bit about and and i want to move on to sort of the your broadcasting debuts as well but there are a couple of games that you mentioned to me in our sort of chats before this that i really think we need to just have a quick couple of minutes on the first one was fulham port vale in march 1987 so if you could just give us a little (laughs) taste of what happened there that would be fantastic yeah well no the, the um the thing is, around those sort of Gillingham times, when I was not in Hull, when I was back home, yeah. again, like like Hull, I would go out to Rotherham and Doncaster and Grimsby and Scunthorpe and so on. Mm. I didn't always go to Gillingham. I went to Leighton Orient or Brentford, who were well down the leagues then. Um, yeah. Sometimes to Watford or West Ham or whatever. West yeah. Ham less often because it felt too big for me. Um, but Fulham were third division then. And mm. I had, a, I for some reason... I convinced my then girlfriend occasionally to, to, to come with me. And she came with me to Fulham against Port Vale, March 1987. Yeah. Uh, Ray Lewington was the player manager of, of Fulham at that oh, time yeah, 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 against uh, John Rudge's Port Vale. And, and Port Vale won 6-0. Um, and it was, it was, um, oh, it was Andy Jones. I looked, I had to look at Andy Jones scored yeah. a hat-trick. Um, I, I remember two things about that day. One was that it was boat race day. And we Mm. stood, uh, whether we actually saw the boat race go past, I don't know. Possibly we did, I think. Um, The, um, but but we certainly saw the palaver of the boat race and various flotillas going down the Thames Mm -hmm. and all that sort of thing. And I looked at Oxford Big Cambridge by four lengths. And that was the year of the famous Oxford Rebellion, Dan Topolsky and all of that. Oh, yeah. The the historians of the boat race might, you know. Anyway, that was, that was a famous, that was a famous year. Um, for the boat race but what struck me again as I kind of continued to learn more about fans and fandom was how hilarious the Fulham fans were because there was on the terrace on the at the Hammersmith end there was yeah. um, on the one hand the fury of the hardcore supporters who were losing 6-0 yeah, yeah. at home and there was genuine fury oh, in turn, yeah. well, you know all that sort of stuff but on the other hand there was fantastic humour because right. Fulham, Fulham fans now, I mean, Fulham now is a serious club that, mm-hmm. you know, wins football matches at the top level. Yeah. Fulham then, I mean, had been through its struggles and nearly gone bust and nearly gone out of business and had been yeah, rattling yeah. around at the bottom and, and so on. Um, and I, you, you know, I, I don't want to take the mickey out of Fulham because it mattered to its people then, as all clubs do. But, but it, 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 some of its own supporters perceived it as a little bit of a kind of joke. And, yes. and at, so I remember at four or five nil, then some of the supporters, Fulham supporters, began the chance of we want ten, um, <laughs> as it were, against them. <laughs> so, yes, so yeah. That's that's the kind of stage they got to. Um, but but in, in a way, the interest of that game from this far out, I mean, nearly whatever, 35, 40 years on, mm. um, is the transformation of Fulham. I mean, you know, mm. and, and what I love about Fulham is that they have transformed into a very serious club. We've been to a European final and, and mm-hmm. done so much else. Um, but essentially, you go to Craven Cottage, you know it's full these days as opposed to rattling around with four, five, six thousand. Yeah, yeah. um, it feels the same. And I, I don't know about you, but I still love covering football at Fulham. There's something, yeah, no, very, there's something. One of my favourite It's grounds utterly unique. It's a, it's yeah. a beautiful place. Yeah. Yeah. And um, with obviously the new stand coming, but they haven't taken away the the beauty of the corner and little, uh, yeah, it, exactly. It, way it's, yeah. it's in my top five grounds yeah. to go to. I think. So. Yeah. Um, talking of grounds to go to, I don't think I've ever been to this ground. Well, in fact, I know I've never been to it. But you need to tell us a little bit about before we move on to your broadcasting debuts. Doncaster against Halifax, because this has got a little bit of a backstory to it as well as being quite a, an interesting match. Yeah, well, I mean, I mean, this was in, uh, I began my, as it were, quotes, broadcasting career on the mm-hmm. 1st of March, 1990, which is when I joined BBC Radio Leeds. So I was, right. I was a, I was a brand new rookie reporter on a yeah. patch, which had 
Leeds United, Bradford City, Huddersfield Town, Halifax Town. Mm -hmm. And so uh, I was at a stage where, obviously, I was never going to be allowed to ask for a day off. And the no. day of Doncaster Halifax was the day of one of my best uni friends getting married. And uh, I missed his wedding to cover Doncaster Rovers against Halifax. Uh, yeah. Because it, it just simply wouldn't have occurred to me to think I could ask yeah. for a day off work. And everybody understood. And nobody was insulted. At least I don't think so. Um and 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 I was really excited to be there at, at Bellevue, as it was then. Yes. Uh, and uh, the two managers that day were for Doncaster Rovers, Billy Bremner, oh, no yeah, less, yeah, yeah, yeah. and uh, for uh, another another Scotsman in charge of Halifax, who was very very kind to me in my early days of reporting, Jim McCallion. I'll give the answer to another oh. quiz question, Richard. Jim McCalliog. Um, well, give me a sort of clue as to where we're going. Well, with I'll tell you because I'll string yeah. you along otherwise. He, right. he, the answer to the quiz question that used to be posed about him was, who played in the FA Cup finals of 1966 and 76? Okay. And right. I think, Fair well, enough. I know he played for Southampton in 76 in the famous he win did. against Manchester United. Bobby Stokes, uh, yep. And I think, was it Sheffield Wednesday in 66? Sheffield I think Wednesday, have... Everton, wasn't it? I yeah, think I think so. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So anyway, he was the manager. Halifax, as they always tended to be, were right towards the bottom of the fourth division. Mm. Um, in fact, they finished 23rd of 24 that year. Colchester finished beneath them. Uh, but um, essentially, Doncaster were wiping the floor with them. Doncaster were 3-0 up at half time. Yeah. Um, actually, they were 3-0 up after half an hour. Uh, the star name in the Doncaster team, by the way, I looked up uh, the other day, was Rufus Brevet, who went on oh, to have really? a... Pre- yeah, QPR. A, yeah. yeah, QPR, Fulham, West Ham. Fulham. He yeah, was yeah, playing yeah. for Doncaster that day. Uh, wow. so there you are. But Halifax, remarkably, uh, came back in the second half and scored their fourth goal in the 89th minute and won 4-3. And those wow. things just didn't happen to Halifax. Um, no. uh, and th- there was a player there... Well, the goal scorers, Mitch Cook, I vaguely remember. Billy Barr scored the second goal, who was, a, right. who was quote, a ledge of Halifax at the time. Okay. Everybody loved Billy Barr. The, the equaliser was scored after 82 minutes by a player who, for for an for a, um, aspirant broadcaster, was beautifully named Brian Butler, who at that time oh. was, was absolutely the cream of BBC football broadcasters. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. then Nick Richardson scored the winner. But... But I do remember Jim McCallion, who was a, a lovely guy and very, very mm. kind to me as a wet behind the ears, very naive reporter, um, mm-hmm. came bounding up the wooden stand at Bellevue, having stood at the uh, mouth of the tunnel and shaken his players' hands on this remarkable achievement. He came up and sort of came bounding up. It was about five to five. Yeah. And, he, and he came into the little glass greenhouse press room and mm-hmm. said, um, who'd like to interview me? And, wow. uh, and I had to say to him, I said, I'm really sorry, Jim, but you're going to have to wait till after the football results. So the football results came on at five o'clock. And so, bless him, he came back at six minutes past five. And, oh, lovely. and on, a, on a patch where Leeds United were the big story every week, uh, Halifax Town led the show. So wow. uh, that was a really exciting day for me and for them. Great, It was a great day. I mean, it was a yes. great day. If you love and feel football, then yeah. those, those are the great days. Yeah. And would you say it's worth missing your best mate's wedding for, do you think? Without question. Yeah. Okay. Without question. Well, uh, well, if he's listening to this, we'll we'll, um, we'll edit that one out for you. Um, <laughs> so in a way, that you know, that's a remarkable turnaround to be 3-0 down, as you say, after 20-odd 20, 20 minutes and Halifax not being a great team and then to go on to win 4-3. It sort of almost set you up for your one of your more famous commentaries, the Roma-Barcelona Champions League game. <laughs> yeah, but, you know, that's what it was. Lunas is scoring the goal. Um, yeah. So let's just quickly, we, we couple more, couple more games I'd like to get into. Your first radio commentary, which was in September 1990, I believe. And in, in our little chats we had, you, you were quite harsh on yourself there. Yeah, listen, I... I feel as though looking back on it, it was Bradford City against Swansea. Swansea, um, yeah. Yeah. I, I suppose we all have to start somewhere. Yeah. Um, and I, first of all, I was extremely nervous, extremely nervous to the point of freezing. 
really. Yeah. I don't think yeah. I did freeze. I was able to spout some words, but yeah. I, I lost all kind of sense in my limbs and, and, and I was just mm. numb with fear and yeah. white with fear. And by the way, I've felt that way plenty since, but, but I suppose I've learned to control it better. Mm. And two, and I don't hold this against myself particularly, but I didn't realise then the extent to which you have to prepare. Nice. Um, and so um, I, I assumed in my naivety that as I always had done, I'd turn up, I'd look at the back of the programme, see who's playing and off we go. Mm. Um, and it doesn't work like that, really. Um, yeah. And I, I think I must have found a way through it. You know, nobody mm -hmm. sacked me. Nobody came up and said, um, you were terrible today. No, in fact, I remember my boss saying, well done, you know, we'll okay. get you another one of those soon and all, all of right. those things. But I, I strongly suspect he was being kind and, and I, I, which he was, I mean, he was a very kind man yeah. uh, and he, he wanted me to do well. And, and I think anybody who goes on to have any sort of a career needs always to remember to be grateful to the people who were tolerant of them mm. at the beginning, you know, yeah. and, and he really was, you know, he might've said, you know what, you need to go away give it six months, learn something about how you prepare and, and how you do yeah, this yeah, thing. Yeah. And maybe we'll give you another chance. But he threw me in again the next week. And, right. you know, you we all need people like that. We need that stroke of luck. And whether I was as bad as I feel as I was in my sort of mind's eye or not, doesn't really matter. No. Um, it, it, it was a really important day in my life because um, it, it just jolted me into knowing what's required to do the job properly yes. really yeah, yeah. Yeah, 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 uh, yeah. and and how to sort of comport myself and how to be ready for it uh, mentally and and very physically in terms of of basic note taking and all of that sort of thing yeah and and when you yeah. so you were doing the for radio leads i assume so yeah. was it just you commentate or did you have someone next to you who you could play off no i think it was just me i'm pretty yeah. sure it was just me and actually it was a it was quite a big story for bradford that day because i think i think i mean this is all a blur i might be getting this yeah. wrong but i think swansea were managed by terry yora who obviously oh, had been okay. a big part of the Ooh, bradford player. story yeah, yeah, and, yeah. and former oh, player yeah. and was yeah, big yeah. with leeds and all of that stuff and all the trauma mm. that bradford had been through yeah. he'd been through you know so his return to bradford was a big mm. tale um and really uh i'm not sure i was the best one equipped to tell that tale but but anyway, you know, this is all, you know, a long, long time yeah. ago. And uh, I, I might be completely misrepresenting the whole thing. But that's my I look back on it and I feel a little bit cold because I sort of feel that's the day when it might have all gone horribly wrong. It didn't. It didn't. I'm mm. exaggerating it. You know, it was fine, yeah. I suppose. But but uh, I, I just remember feeling very young. You know, yes. as if everybody around me was better equipped to do this than I was. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, I know. I've, yeah. I've been in a few uh, press boxes and, and uh, yeah, you do. Sometimes you have imposter syndrome thinking, what am I yeah. doing here? And all these people know so much more than I do and are so much better. I, and by the way, it never leaves me. I always <laughs> think that. But there we are. Yeah. Yeah. So let's just <clears throat> wrap this up by then moving to television. So you've been doing quite a lot of work within Radio Leeds, then you move on to the network. So whether it was yeah. Radio 2 at the time or Radio 5. So the first game that you commentated on in terms of, because uh, you're obviously at IT, did you do your match of the day fairly soon after? No, it was, no, it was my, a little bit later, wasn't it? Match of the day came... Um, 97, uh, I think you said. Yeah, that. 97. So... That would have been two or three years into my sort of Radio 5 or 5 Live as it became yeah. career. Um, the, uh, it was still at a time when Match of the Day and older listeners and viewers will remember this, where basically there were two main games, a sort of third game, and yeah. then a roundup. And yeah. so it, it's not like it is today where there's a commentator on every game and blah, blah, blah. Mm. So opportunities to do that were scarce. Yeah. Um, and that opportunity came up. I think Barry Davis was off doing something else and, and whatever. Mm -hmm. And, and I, I, I was given a chance to, to do a game on match of the day. Um, and that, that was a sort of thrilling moment, really. Uh, so I was on the third game that day, which was Sheffield Wednesday against Everton. 
Mm-hmm. Um, and it's another day when I, I, I felt sort of frozen with fear and, and so on. Um, but I was fortunate because David Pleat was the manager of Sheffield Wednesday, who right. um, had become a friend because he used to be a co-commentator on Radio 5. And right. so I'd worked with him and, and, yeah, and so yeah. um, knew him a bit. And there were personality players as well who uh, gladly um, Carboni and Decanio both scored, which, yep. which gives you a chance, you know, uh, as, as I went on to learn in television, player recognition is more or less everything, you know, shouting mm-hmm. the right name. Um, yeah. Is what, and so if you get Carboni and you get Decanio, you know you're going to know who they are. Um, yeah. And so that so it was a kind game to me in many regards. I always remember um, the first person to call me very kindly was Motti afterwards, oh. after it went out. And he took the trouble to listen and watch the the whole 90 minutes, not just the seven minutes that went out on oh, match okay, the day, okay. and, and to, to give me feedback. And it, one of the nice things he said was... Um, you you didn't talk too much you let it breathe and and whatever which is which is rule number one and we all break it i know that mm. before people start throwing things at me um <laughs> that uh when you leave radio or stop doing radio start doing telly they tell you you mustn't talk all the time only talk when you're adding to the picture and all of that sort of thing yeah. um and um it's a very difficult thing to do and it takes years and years to make that transition properly mm. if indeed we ever do uh, but Mossy said that to me. He said you did really well. You didn't. You didn't talk a lot at all. And I thought to myself deep down, that's kind of you to use that as a compliment. But I think I didn't talk because I was just frozen. I didn't. Sorry, I, yeah. I didn't have anything to say. So, <laughs> so maybe that's a that's a yeah. That that was a a useful sort of spin on it. Yeah, no, it was Richie yeah. Benno's uh, advice, isn't it? Yeah. You know, to yeah. not not uh talk you know let it fill out and you know Richard Benno one of the great commentators in um sporting world so one final question Peter of sort of because it is to do with first and it is to do with Deb so the first can you remember the first game you commentated on in Europe so because you know you get used to Mm. doing your BBC Radio Leeds Mm. you're doing Leeds you're doing Bradford you're doing Dong but then you move into match of the day and but the first one when you're actually outside the country. Well, I know you're you're getting towards wrapping this up, so I'll try to be quick. But there are two answers to that question. One yep. is that I was fortunate enough to do Leeds' first European tie away in Stuttgart for BBC Radio Leeds. Okay, and right. that was another pinch me moment. I'll never forget getting on the plane at Leeds Bradford Airport uh, yep. at the back of the plane with all the hacks, all the <laughs> sort of number one journalists from all the national newspapers who were all yeah. blasé and having a drink and talking to each yeah, other as yeah. if they did it every week. And I was, I had literally never flown in an aeroplane before. Never oh, mind, wow. never mind covered again. And I was sat there sort of uh, clinging onto my seat for takeoff. <laughs> like I must have looked like a little child then as well. But that was a thrilling, right. thrilling trip. Um, mm. But in terms of television, I joined ITV in um, the spring of 1998. Mm-hmm. And um, towards the end of that year's Champions League, I was doing for the, the there were there were two games on. I think it must have been a quarter final night. There were two mm-hmm. games on. One there was no British involvement. Right. There was one game at Real Madrid, and there was one game at Juventus. I was at Juventus Monaco, which was just going to be for highlights. There was no ITV two, three, mm-hmm. four other channel. Then yeah, it was just yeah, yeah. ITV and the yeah. other. And the Real Madrid game, which was on the network, Clive Tilsley was commentating on it. The goal fell down or something. There was some sort of major. Oh. Uh, issue which stopped the Real Madrid game kicking off and oh. so the decision was taken they were going to come to me oh, at Juventus word. and so it was a great thing it was a lucky lucky break because I got 30 seconds warning that I was about to go live on telly to do a Champions League game for the first time so I had no time to think no. about it I just had to do it my other lucky break was that the great Ian St John was sat with me who who was by not only an absolutely charming bloke but also, uh, of course, a seasoned, famous, famous broadcaster for all yes. his years. He it didn't bother him whether he was live on telly or not. He, you know, no, no, no. That, that's absolutely fine. And he uh, coaxed me through it and was was the perfect accompaniment. Um, so, so yeah, that was my first sort of big live Champions League game. And it happened by mistake, which was the best possible way for it to happen. That, that's really interesting, actually, because I... I... Had Stuart Robson, the ex-West Ham Arsenal mm. player, 
on this podcast um, a month or so ago. And his first game when he was only, I think he was only 17. So he actually was playing for Arsenal at West Ham, but he didn't find out about it until about half an hour before the game. But the manager had told his parents the night before, but said, don't tell Stuart Robson because yeah. he'd be up all night and worried about it. And that is very yeah. analogous to what you've just said about yeah, the absolutely. country in Europe. Yeah, yeah. Stuart's told me that story. No, it's, it's, um, it's interesting, isn't it? But, you know, he was 16 or 17 or whatever. I, yeah. I was supposed to be a fully grown man. But as I think <laughs> we've established over the course of this conversation, I, I'm not sure I've reached that status even now. So no, well, I, I, I think we should, we're all kids, you know, it's like Peter yeah. Pan, isn't it? We're all kids yeah. deep down and we don't need to cover it up. But I think that's a great place to finish because uh, I've, I've very much enjoyed following you from Boothry Park to Priestfield to then to, you know, Juventus and you know, yeah. your first um, European debut, if you like. So we'd just like to say thanks very much peter if there's anything you think you want to throw in just just do it now or, no um... that was an absolute joy for me thank richard you. thank you thank you for allowing me to indulge myself in uh, a lovely trip of nostalgia brilliant well that it's been an absolute pleasure thank you thank you